Hello and welcome to Weathersnap, bringing you your weather and climate headlines for this week. I'm Claire Nazir. And I'm Alex Deakin. Now, this week we've got a bit of a wintry theme running through our talking points. We're going to be talking about Arctic and Antarctic sea ice, current snow conditions across the Alps. But first of all, Alex, there's much buzz around this topic, isn't there? What's happening right now with the SSW? Tell me what it is first. SSW is Southern Stratospheric Warming. Now, you said we're talking about cold things and then here we are talking about warming. But Southern Stratospheric Warming can lead to changes in our weather. But there's a lot of ifs and buts and there's a long chain of events that need to happen. Let's start with what's happening at the moment. Actually, let's start with what happened a couple of weeks ago when there was warming in the stratosphere. High, high up. 30, 50 kilometres above the pole. We did see a bit of a a jump and a bit of a weakening of the winds up there. But that's kind of recovered now. And the polar vortex, which is what the SSW is all to do with, has recovered. So at the moment, the polar vortex is pretty active, spinning around the North Pole in the stratosphere, miles and miles up, uh, and it's doing its thing. But there are strong indications now that we will see sudden stratospheric warming next week. That is when the temperature high up in the stratosphere suddenly jumps up, which is an indication that the polar vortex, this ring of winds that forms every winter, is weakening. And it's set to weaken and actually reverse next week. There's an 80 percent chance that this is going to happen. And if the winds reverse, we'll call that a major SSW event. So that's what's likely to happen next week. And there's a lot of excitement around this. Every year, there is a group of people who anticipate a major SSW, and for good reason. But a major SSW doesn't mean one thing or like a definite one event happening. It can mean a number of things. Two weeks ago, we spoke about the stratospheric polar vortex and um, a lot of interest around that. This major SSW has impacts across our jet stream. Yes. So it's important to note that sudden stratospheric warming is likely to happen next week. But any effects on the weather to us at the surface aren't likely to happen for probably a couple of weeks beyond that. So the end of the month. But what happens is the stratospheric polar vortex weakens, even reverses direction. And that is signalled by the sudden stratospheric warming. But actually, that's only kind of one part of it. The more important factor here is that that reversing of the winds high up in the atmosphere can kind of filter down. The ripple effects come down through the atmosphere. I'm moving my fingers down through the air. You can't see that because it's a podcast. But if you could, it's that ripple effect that comes back down through the atmosphere. And a couple of weeks later, every SSW is different, but usually 10 days to three weeks later, we get an effect on the jet stream. And the general effect is that the jet stream becomes weaker and more amplified. Now, that just means it becomes more wavy. So instead of barreling across the Atlantic or round those middle attitude like it often does, it becomes more wavy. The waves get bigger. And that leads to a change in our weather patterns. Now, when the jet stream's active, our weather's chopping and changing more frequently. That's the kind of usual setup. But when we get these more wavy weather patterns, we get our weather patterns become more slow moving. So the low pressures and the high pressures kind of get stuck in a rut and don't tend to move around as much. And so we have this pattern, which we call a blocking pattern with more static weather systems. And if we get a more static weather system, that can lead to colder conditions. The block is in the right place. But it can also mean that the block is in a different position and we get a completely different type of weather. But it does mean an SSW that we are increasingly likely to have this blocking pattern and that could lead to a colder spell. And obviously colder weather increases the chance of a bit of snow. Now, another reason why people are excited about this is because this is what happened in 2018. We had an SSW and that led to the strong easterly winds and significant snowfall across highly populated parts of the country. But it doesn't always. It just leads to this blocking pattern. It doesn't always lead to easterly winds. 2019, there was an SSW and the effects on the UK uh, were barely noticed. So it doesn't always lead to it. That is crucial. 
We do produce a 10 day trend every Wednesday. And obviously that will be your first indicator if things are going in one direction or another. And here at the Met Office, there are meteorologists, scientists who are keeping a keen eye on things happening across the stratosphere. It was in our daily brief this morning and it will be again, I'm, I'm quite sure. So an interesting one to watch. And there's more on YouTube. Like you said, 10 day trend, keep an eye on that. But we also did a deep dive. So if you want to find out more about that in the current situation, there's our deep dive video from Tuesday on YouTube. Something so high up, not even related to the weather making layer of the atmosphere, the troposphere, can actually have local impacts like we saw in 2018 at the end of February. And in fact, yeah. I remember we were forecasting down in Exeter and we could see this just about to happen and that cold easterly wind and then storm era pushed up from Iberia and clashed with that cold air. And I had to get home. I had to get home to the northwest because I had to see my family and I knew that everything would grind to a halt before, before everything just stopped for many, many days. And then we saw freezing rain. We saw snow. We saw blizzards. Oh, it was all, it was just, yeah. The freezing rain was incredible. I've never seen freezing rain like that before. There was literally a centimetre thick of ice on top of all the snow. Uh, but again, like you said, that you know, an important part of that snow was that storm Emma coming up. You know, easterly winds by themselves often don't generate a lot of snow. You just get cold. So, you know, you do have to have everything coming together to get significant snowfall, particularly uh, where I am in the southwest. So, yeah, still a lot to happen. We'll keep you posted and any weather related to this won't be happening for a while yet, not to the end of the month. Good to know. Now, I've been uh, liaising with a, a scientist who studies sea ice, Dr. Ed Blockley. We've had him on the Mostly Climate podcast before, and he's given me the lowdown of what's happening right now across the Antarctic as well as the Arctic. So let's start with the Antarctic sea ice extent. It's currently at a record low for this time of year and in fact has been since the last week of December uh, last year. The summer minimum is likely to be reached later this month. Obviously the southern hemisphere are in their summer right now so Antarctic sea ice is at a low so it's at a minimum um, and the Antarctic extent is likely to drop below two million square kilometres for only the second time observed during the 44 year satellite record. The extent grows through the winter months and then it reclines through the summer months. And more worrying than what I've just said is that it may even surpass the record low of 1.92 million square kilometres set last year on the 25th of February 2022. So that's a watch this space. Alex, Arctic sea ice, where are we with that at the moment? Well, also uh, pretty low. Currently, the third lowest for this time of year. Now, obviously, yeah, in the opposite to the Antarctic, the Arctic should be pretty significant at this time of year. It's, it's approaching a maximum. At the moment, though, it is third lowest for this time of year. Only 2017, 2018 had lower amounts of sea ice. The extent is particularly low on the Barents Sea, just north of Norway. Uh, the Arctic winter extent is likely to reach its maximum in mid-March. So they don't exactly always match up, but that's the time of year, mid-March, when it reaches its maximum. And things can change before then as uh, sea ice responds strongly to changes in weather, as you might imagine. But currently it is pretty low. OK, so that's sea ice. Let's now go to snow. Last weekend, the alpine conditions were pretty divided. It was sunny in the west and very cold in the east. But through the last week, even though, yes, we have seen some cold and sunny weather everywhere, there has been some snow as well, particularly across the Austrian Alps, uh, Germany and Czech, Slovakian mountains, seeing about a metre of snow, but very little across the western side. That's Italy, France and Switzerland. Also, the Pyrenees not seeing a lot. And obviously, this is peak season for skiers. A lot of people going away for half term. And, uh, you know, there's not a lot going to be happening through the next few days. It's remaining mostly dry and also sunny. Uh, we could even see a little bit of more surge of warmth coming in through uh, next week. But the good news is at least there has been some snow leading up to the half term. Our latest Mostly Climate podcast, our sister podcast, Mostly Climate, which focuses on climate science, we discuss alpine snow cover and the future of snow and how 
ski resorts are going to adapt to that, how they're going to build in some resilience to actually make sure that there is a ski season every year, which uh, obviously contributes to the local tourism and is part of the, the culture of the Alpine region. So that's really interesting. It's a, a great podcast. Check out the Most Sea Climate podcast where we're talking about alpine snow, the future of snow across the Alps. And now an important date coming up. It's International Women and Girls in Science Day this Saturday. Now, earlier I spoke to Met Office Katrina McNeil about how she arrived in a science role in the Met Office. We work at the interface between science and policy. We spend a lot of the time translating and synthesising the science that comes out and making it easier to understand and in shorter bite-sized chunks for policymakers and ministers. I wasn't brought up in a science world. I did science at school, I did okay. Um, I wouldn't say I was particularly brilliant at it. I liked it, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily something I wanted to specifically do anything with. Um, and I think it's just all the jobs I've done. The one thing that's gone through everyone is problem solving. So seeing a problem and learning how to fix it and giving people the information to be able to fix the problem. And that's exactly what I do in my role. I have the most amazing scientists behind me who do this incredible research and I'm able to take that and draw out the most relevant parts for the people that I talk to to make it relevant to their role and be able to do something with that. The Met Office has been brilliant. It means I can actually develop a bit more. So I'm taking what I've learned and understood over all the years of working and putting it into hopefully doing a master's degree in behavioural science. My advice is don't have it all mapped out from day one. You can do lots of different things and it's the experience that you gain along the way that lets you find something that you truly love. A brilliant chat with Katrina, you know, just so heartfelt, so passionate and a great ambassador for women in science. Absolutely. So, so good to hear that. And now we know what knowledge integration is as well. <laughs> now I know what the KI team do. <laughs> oh, they're very pivotal, very instrumental in the Met Office. So you don't mess with the KI team, no, certainly don't. don't. <laughs> so Alex, I think, I mean, I ask you this each week, really. Can you do the weather in three lines? Because there's not a lot going on. Is there this weekend? There isn't a lot going on this weekend. It's mostly going to be dry. It's going to turn a little milder. There'll be a mix of cloud and sunshine and uh, not a huge amount of rainfall around. Any rain there is will mostly be focused across parts of northern Scotland. And uh, it will be a bit breezy at times, but not as windy as it has been. Uh, still the likelihood of a bit of fog and frost at night, but, you know, nothing unusual about that in February. But it won't be as cold as it was to start this week across parts of the south. And the fog probably won't be as dense either. It has been a cold week in the south, hasn't it? We've seen some very low temperatures yet again, a real reverse of what we typically would expect for February. The mildest air has always been in the north and northwest. Like last week, we're talking about this last week, it's almost like Groundhog Day, which was obviously at the beginning of February. But, you know, um, will we see a reverse in fortunes? Well, we'll keep you posted here on with Snap as well. Now, just before we go, let's head over to Ollie Clayton. He is back, ladies and gentlemen, with the highs and lows. Here are your UK extremes for the week beginning 30th of January. Kew Gardens peaked at 14 Celsius on Friday, making it the warmest place and day of the week. Into the early hours of Sunday morning, the temperature dipped to minus 4.8 Celsius in Tyrone, Castle Derg. This was the coldest place. Northern Scotland had a very wet day on Tuesday the 2nd. 61.2 millimetres of rain was measured in Rasalik, Sutherland. And finally, Sunday was the sunniest day, with Exeter in Devon clocking up 8.1 hours of sunshine. Thanks very much, Ollie. <clears throat> so, women in science, girls in science. Alex, your girls, do they love science? They do, actually, yeah. Yeah, my daughter, my eldest in particular, has just started secondary school, so she is very keen on science. She knows most of the periodic table. And, uh, yeah, I'll be letting her know all about Women in Science Day on uh, Saturday and making mm. sure she's doing her homework on Saturday. That'll be my job. And then I'll oh. let her play football on Sunday if she does her homework. <laughs> she, oh, you're a good dad, aren't you? You really are. Well, Sienna had homework the other day and I was absolutely salivating. She goes, Mummy, uh, we're doing Southwest Monsoon. Oh, did you show that video of you and Aiden, the Givenchy yeah. advert? Yes, it was quite cool, wasn't it? Mantra. 
it was very stylish that um that uh, explainer uh you should oh. check that out on youtube see what i used to look like seven years ago before lockdown um so yes doing the monsoon she's key stage three and i'm really pleased because it was really interesting all all about the contrast in in warmth across the equator to the cold tibetan plateau and how this the rain moves up towards the barrier of the himalayas and then retreats again and by the end she'd lost the will to live so there you go <laughs> did not make a great teacher if, uh... no not at all Anyway, that's all from WeatherSnap. Thank you very much to Alex Deacon. As always, great to hear your insights on the SSW. Check out YouTube and TikTok. Lots of information on there about such things and more. And we'll be back next week. Have a good weekend and enjoy your week ahead. WeatherSnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.